Welcome to RPV City Talk. RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to RPV City Talk. Joining me now is the Mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, Mayor Jim Knight. Always terrific to have you here to update our residents and all the important issues and the good things happening. Always right enjoyable here in to RPV. sit down and have a chat. All right, well of course, making headlines. Last show we were together and still of course for a while is gonna be what's going on with water issues and the drought and everybody wants to know what do we need to do to help reduce our water consumption and to abide by state restrictions. So why don't you kind of give us an overview of what the latest is regarding water restrictions here in the city. Yeah, well, it's still evolving. <clears throat> I happened to check the uh, water, State Water Resources Control Board. They had a meeting on uh, May 1st <clears throat> and they, um, they have a list of things they want to recommend for the local water districts and wholesalers and retailers. And they had a draft resolution. Uh, they did a survey first. They, they, got, they reached out to business and people and, and communities and, and government and they did a survey to find out what they feel the issues were. And they put up, they came up with a draft resolution um, and they outlined measures that local suppliers should look at. One of which is uh, they want, they were recommending possibly doubling the number of tiers with a 2% increment instead of a 4% increment. And what that tries to do is try to refine the actual water consumption so that there's uh, less possibility of somebody being in one tier unfairly. And so they're trying to, mm -hmm. trying to make them more, more um, geared to what the water conservation is. They want to take in consideration climate lot size, but I also want to take in consideration income. So there's a favoritism to try to help the low-income people, which in our case in the, in the uh, peninsula would mean that there um, be less lenient in terms of the higher income community. So there's, there's, this, there's an income component that they're putting into their, right. into their recommendations. Um, they, want to, they do want to take into consideration previous conservation measures, um, but they're using a percentage, as we've talked about, and the 36% for the city, uh, for the residents here, is quite a bit. Right, because the statewide overall, they want to achieve a 25% right. reduction throughout the state. But some are, it can range from 8 to 36%, right? Right. But we get in the high end, 36%. Are you saying that's because of we're being affluent community? or? Uh, well, they, they, some people uh, uh, think that that's, that's the case. And, but, yes, that's partially the case. But um, I think what, what's happened is they're using a metrics of gallons per day per capita. Okay. And so when you get into a low density, low dense area, like our land use up here is, is low density, larger lot sizes, um, and so we have per capita higher gallons per day use. It doesn't necessarily mean that the particular person in their home is not conserving as much water as a home in other areas that are high density land use. Um, so there's certain things I think they still need to uh, look at to make things much more fair. Um, but at this point, the 36 percent is looking like what we're supposed to achieve that, that's and a reduction they have. here they, on the peninsula. They have an entire chart. They've gone through every every community in the state of California, and they have them tiered according to the percentages, and we're in the <coughs> highest percentage, which is 30, 36 percent. Okay. So Cal Water, as we know, they're having meetings throughout the month um, with all the different communities, and I know by the time this show runs, the peninsula residents will have been invited to a meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but you said they'll be ongoing, so it's a good way to really find out what the deal is, is just to contact Cal Water. Yes, they are. They're having community meetings to get input from people, uh, get some of these issues ironed out. Uh, if you go to their website, it's basically calwater.com. Mm -hmm. uh, go on their website. We're in the um, Rancho Dominguez district. Right. So don't look for Rancho Palos Verdes district. It's Rancho Dominguez district. And there's, there's several different Dominguez districts. We're in the Palos Verdes Rancho Dominguez Dang. district. Okay. And so uh, you can go to the website, and there's some upcoming meetings. I know they have them at their central Torrance office at 2632 West 237th Street, usually at 6 o'clock in the evening at their, at their headquarters there. Okay. And there's, there's, some, there's one tomorrow for Palos Verdes, and that's a little late for this broadcast, but uh, I think there's one May 21st for the Hermosa um, and Redondo area, which should be closer to where we are. Mm -hmm. But there, there's, look at the website. 
contact them and find out when the next meeting is if you want to have input on that. And I think a lot of the confusion, certainly with residents and talking with just my own friends, is they're saying, well, we've already been really done a great job reducing our water, mm -hmm. especially the drought's been going on now for four years. Everybody's been trying to do their part. So, uh, for example, if I've heard them, like, if you've already reduced, say, the last year you reduced your bill and mm -hmm. by 20% of your consumption, does that mean now you only have to achieve 16%? This next round, I don't know how that that's works. That's a good question. I, I don't think all that's been played out yet. So, Cal Water says they will have a, what's called an appeal process. Okay. What that means, I don't know, and how burdensome that will be, I don't know. But um, you're right. Uh, for those of us that have been conserving over a long period of time, it's going to be hard to take a really lean water use and reduce it another 36 percent. Exactly. What are you yeah. doing your own in your own lifestyle to reduce at everything your house? I can? Um, I've got low f uh, flush toilets, shower heads, low flow. Um, I don't use a dishwasher. I hand wash the dishes, and I don't run the water the whole time. I soap them up and then rinse them off. Yeah. And I want to get the hot water to a, a remote shower. I have a bucket. I collect the water. I have a rain barrel. I have uh, drought tolerant plants. I mean. I'm not sure what else I can do. Right. Of course, there's already prohibited uses of water that have been going on for a while, mm -hmm. like things you're not supposed to ever water your driveway. And uh, if you're going to be watering your lawn, you're supposed to have a type of handle, whatever. That yeah, well, especially with a car wash. I mean, if you're washing your car, you're supposed to have a handle that shuts it off when you're not like using it. shut off nozzle. Right. And the, the lawn, they, they, they want to restrict it to two days a week. Um, they also would like to have people that have rain sensitive uh, uh, mechanisms in the controllers so if it's raining it gets shut off and so mm -hmm. on things like that right now let's talk about the city how, in terms of reduction here what is the uh, city doing and I know there's also incentives to the residents the city's doing as well in terms of uh, reduction in fees uh, for permits you're gonna do things like that I want to mm -hmm. talk about what the city's efforts to be part of the solution yeah, well, the, the city has its own um, uh, parks and so on it maintains. Um, they've separated out the what they call the, um, was it drought, uh, drought tolerant type of grass, or the dorm, they, what they say dormant grass that goes dormant during, during the winter. They just let that go. If you go to City Hall, you see all the places up there are brown. You know, it's, it's, it's all brown. Um, and then, of course, the other parks that we may have to maintain for sports and so on, we have to be very efficient in how we uh, utilize the water there. City facilities, we're going to look at those, assess whether we can have uh, any water savings in, in the fixtures at city facilities. Um, we are, there's, there's an area of the median um, that's between the sidewalk and the street that is city-owned, but it's the responsibility of the homeowner to, to maintain it. So um, we're going to reduce the fee for public right-of-way. People want to replant that with drought right. tolerant and so on. And again, I think last year the city's reduced its water consumption by 20%. By 20%, that right? that's so correct. We're all doing our part here. Right. So I guess it's like you say, there's a lot of things moving on. And, uh, it's, and uh, it's a as complex As it continues picture. to trickle down to us, yeah, right. that term. Yes, it trickled down. Yes. Is there anything you want residents watching right now just to be aware of? I know this is obviously it's generating a lot of concern and... And nobody wants to run out of water. Well, just keep your eyes on the various water districts and, and what uh, they have certain rebate programs for replacing your grass. Um, uh, if you don't have the low, flush, the low uh, flow, uh, either for toilet or for shower, they have rebate programs for that and they have fixtures. Just look at what other kind of water conservation measures you can take in your own home. And just keep aware of what's coming down the pike. And it hasn't completely fleshed out yet. I think it's, we don't know exactly how it's going to happen uh, in terms of the actual um, way they're going to have the conservation measures Im implemented. I'm sure this matter will continue. You'll continue to address it at the council meetings. We'll, we'll see keep this our eye on, on it. Yeah. Hear you all talking about <laughs> that at the, um, at the council meetings. All right. Well, um, moving on to our next topic, uh, new and exciting in the city, is we have another new employee. That is the finance director. Mm -hmm. Our new city manager um, just hired a direct, our new finance director, Deborah Cullen, who mm -hmm. comes from El Segundo. She's finance director mm -hmm. there. And uh, talk about um, the selection, what this means for our city. Well, uh, 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 Catherine Downs has been the deputy uh, financial director uh, for the, for the uh, city, and she's done an excellent job, fantastic job. She's great. Uh, but the city manager wanted to go out and, and, and do a full recruitment to see what's available out there for a financial director. So he uh, implemented a full RFP that people had to submit. And then uh, he had a panel of independent uh, city managers review the first uh, group of people and come down with a top three. 
And I then, think I read there were 20 uh, that I, had applied I, to I'm not sure exactly how many, but maybe there's 20, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> they, they narrowed it down to about three. And then the, uh, the, the panel of independent people show, rated them one, two, three. Mm -hmm. And uh, the city manager agreed with the first choice, which was Deborah. And uh, Kat was like on the third tier there, but she was right up there, very close to the very top. So um, we're looking forward to her. I mean, he uh, describes her as a top, uh, as highly competent, professional, committed to transparency and produces results. At the same time, understands the needs of employees and, and the city and, and the residents and so on. So yeah. it sounds, I haven't met her yet, but it sounds like right. she's uh, top notch. I guess she's been the finance director at El Segundo again, where the current city manager worked mm -hmm. together with her there when mm -hmm. he was city manager there. And then before that, had about 20 years uh, with the uh, U.S. Postal Service in the area of finance. Right, she's so has she has a broad uh, um, background, but but she has worked, uh, like you say, a long long period of time at uh, city uh, finances. And as you mentioned, um, Kat Downs, who's uh, will re re resume as deputy finance director, and this all is effective June 1st when uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we'll see our new finance director right. join the team. So right. welcome and uh, right in time for the budget. Right there you go, <laughs> and we're gonna we are gonna talk about the budget. But I thought uh, before we get into that, since we're talking about uh, about what's going on with our upper management, you you had a it was your idea to put together a nice uh, community leadership uh, meeting together mm -hmm. so that our new city manager, who's been on board actually now since March, uh, right. uh, Doug, could uh, get to know the other leaders in the community more. That was I was there, you were there. It was it was a really nice get together. It was it was great, and and I wanted to put this together because we have a new city manager. City manager is a very important. Uh, person in in, the, uh, in our city government and so on, and I didn't want to put it on him right away as soon as he ke he came on. So we we kept on looking for a date. We finally got a date together, and it was very good. It was nice for people just to have a chance to sit down and chat with him. And he kind of explained his philosophy and how he he does things. And um, I, I I just always impressed with he has independent leadership capabilities of leading. But he combines that and balances that with taking the input from council and residents. And he's, it's a nice balance between wanting to drive things forward because he has leadership qualities at the same time, taking consideration the council and the residents. And so I, I, he's got a good balance that way. I know when I interviewed him and at that leadership breakfast, a couple things was, like you said, is when I said, you know, what are your goals for this city? He said, I'm not trying to get out of answering this, but my goals are the council goals. Mm -hmm. and that, but at the same time, he said, you know, the challenge obviously is for him is to take an already amazing city and try to keep mm -hmm. you know improving that because we do so many things here well but um, certainly he's a uh He's great to have on the team as well, and I, it was nice to meet his his uh, spouse was there. Mm -hmm. She was wonderful, Annette, and um, she mentioned that they already had been in love in the city because they got married here. That's right. Was, they're not unfamiliar with yeah, Rancho Palos Verdes. They were, they were married, married at Terrenay, married, I believe. No, they, they, they were married, I think, at La Venta, but had, La Venta, uh, honeymooned at uh, honey, honeymooned at. Uh, so Terrenay, he feels right, like you know yeah. this is already close to his heart. So he's in the right place. <laughs> yes. So we're we're glad to have them here. Mm -hmm. All right, so, um, but moving along back to what's going on at City Hall, big thing right now is the budget mm -hmm. and uh, getting that ready and going through the process. What do you want residents to know about how things are looking financially and what kinds of challenges the council will have to pass that budget? Yes, well, uh, uh, as usual, we are doing well financially in the city. Um, we have weathered all of the downturn in the economy uh, by being f fiscally prudent and uh, always coming off with a balanced budget. Um, we're, unlike other cities that have to go into deep debt to try and, and make ends meet. Um, we are going to, up, upcoming on May 19th, have a what, they, what we call a budget exercise. We take a quick glance at the budget, kind of pick some categories that we feel are important, we want to um, uh, focus on or uh, either reduce or increase uh, services, where, where we think the importance is. Um, we have input from the Planning Commission on a five-year capital improvement plan. We have input from uh, the Storm Drain User Fee Committee uh, as to those components of our budget. Uh, we do have a new um, uh, Infrastructure Management Advisory Committee, IMAC Committee, but they're not going to have, they aren't up to speed yet to have input on this current budget because we're coming down the line. We have to get this passed by our last meeting in June. So they'll, they'll take a pass on it this year, but mm -hmm. next year they definitely have a little strong input on right. that. And what, what kind of, how big is the budget right now for the city? It's about $29 million in that, in okay. that range, yeah. And, uh, 
a big part of that revenue comes from Terranea as well, right? So we yeah, we're up in the five million category with Ter Terranea right now with revenue, um, but that's going to cap out here pretty soon because they're they're operating at max right now. Okay. It, it took them a while to build up to that, but I Our think five it's five year anniversary plus they're yeah doing amazing. <laughs> Yeah, they are. So, and on the subject though, bringing money into the coffers, uh, we can maybe jump over to if you're done referencing what's going on with the budget to talk about um, Abalone Cove, some fees now that mm -hmm. we're talking about that will bring more revenue in. Abalone Cove, um, th th talk about what's happening there with the parking lot and, and right. the new fee structure that the council is approving. Well, I, 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 I see this as a kind of a, a new uh, uh, picture for our, our city. We have been discovered, and we have. It's not easy being popular. <laughs> <laughs> Social media is part of that. Um, we also have finally have all these recreational open spaces we have up here, um, and so people and social media they've discovered the Abilene Cove area and the coastline. Just the beauty we have down here. We have a lot of public recreational resources that we support down here: PBIC, the, the preserve. coast along the preserve. We have parks and so on. So. Um, what we're trying to do is um, we're trying to, it, it, down at Avalone Cove, on some weekends, we'd have people lined up all across PV Drive South and the parking lot's full. So we thought, well, maybe we, what we can do is increase the fees down there a little bit. We're going to put in pay stations, and the first 30 minutes will be free. The first two hours is $6, and the balance beyond that for the rest of the day is a total of $12. And... Uh, we are also trying to find a method, not only in Emily Co., but, but really we have a parking problem up at Del, Cero, Del Cero area mm -hmm. um, with the people parking in Crenshaw using the preserve, and that's beginning to flow out into the neighborhoods, and that's creating a problem with the residents up there. So we're going to also have some pay stations up there. And we're looking at a way for uh, residents to have uh, like maybe an annual pass or some kind of reduced fee or something to give the residents a preferential uh, um, a treatment in terms of some of these parking areas and the access to our resources because they're paying the taxes for it and they're getting pushed out by crowds coming here and, and uh, kind of dominating the use. So we want to make sure there's a balance there. I know during the discussion of the uh, Abalone Co-fees, it was um, some concern brought up about the fact you don't want to price your residents out of being able to use that park on a daily basis. That's not the intent. But then on the other hand, in terms of being equitable, when you have to deal with the Coastal Commission, you, mm -hmm. you, that whole issue came up where you can't just get let the residents go in there for free or it'll be appealed by that. Talk about that whole Issue. Yeah, well, that, that's true. Uh, if we had a, a wrapped into our Abilene Cove parking fee structure a free a pass for RP residents, the Coastal Commission told us straight up that they would, they would reject that. They would appeal it. Now, once it gets into the Coastal Commission appeal process, that could take years to resolve, and we would not have our parking structure. So we bifurcated the whole issue of resident access uh, and just went into the parking fee structure. We get that passed, and then the Coastal Commission's mission is is to have, for everybody to have access to the coast. And I understand that. I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful mission. Uh, but we're going to try and find a way to balance that with maybe an annual parking pass or something for residents, uh, where um, they would have they would have some ability to park there and not not have to have all the, the high fees and so on. Or certainly at a reduced cost because right. the residents were paying the five dollars. Right. Well, yeah, Prior. we're 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 paying for all the maintenance of all these resources, our mm -hmm. taxpayers, and so. Um, so anyway, we're, we're going to talk to the Coastal Commission and, 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 and as a separate issue with that and come up with something that's equitable. It'll achieve the goal of what the Coastal Commission has, but also um, help our residents. And on the Avalon Cove, the, the city's done some beautiful renovations down there. It's mm -hmm. really an improved, um, wonderful asset. And there is an electronic gate system. So mm -hmm. regarding these, when you go in now and you take a ticket, there'll still be somebody there collecting fees. That still works like that. Well, no, no. It's actually, it's, it's not quite like that. You just drive in and you have a pay station. And then you, okay. you get a ticket. Gotcha. First 30 minutes is free. Uh, if you're there for two hours, it's six dollars. But you, when you when you exit, it'll calculate. your ticket has to calculate what your time was entering and your time exiting, and then it'll tell you what. The and when does this is. become effective? Uh, well, sure. it becomes effective now, but in terms of putting the stations in, I'm not sure what the Public Works has got planned okay. for that. It's it's going to take a while, but we're, 
sometime this summer, I think we'll have it installed. Okay. Um, you did reference Del Cerro Park, and mm -hmm. that was up um, a big issue being discussed at your prior council meeting. And uh, again, the concern is, you know, everybody is accessing the, the trailhead up there and going up there, and it's just... Um, well, they're, they're parking into the Del Cerro community, and, and people can't have their own cars parked there, and it becomes kind of a real issue up there. You know? So you're looking at different thing, different approaches. What is the council probably going to end up well, doing? Well, we're, we're one idea we're just... Uh, we're looking at is to have again pay stations along Crenshaw Boulevard, take parking off of one side, which would be the uh, uphill, I guess it would be eastern side of Crenshaw there, <coughs> and have that red stripe so you can't park there, and then have slanted parking with pay stations on the downhill um, mm -hmm. side, and pay stations, and then uh, have. Uh, restricted parking in the Del Cerro entrance area. There's one street that, that enters in Del Cerro, so we can have signs for restricted parking, permit only, administer the permits to the local residents there, and um, actually have the Homeowners Association kind of handle the, the, if there's a party, they'll have extra parking passes for parties and so on, and have them handle it. Instead of having this, have the city handle all that and have the people drive down the city and say, hey, I'm at a party on Saturday, I need six passes, mm -hmm. you know, and did, so have the Homeowners Association kind of handle that aspect of it and then have a certain amount of, of permanent type of passes for the residents up there that they can ha maybe have a sticker in the corner of the window or a card or something. We haven't quite worked it out. But something where they, uh, it's the permit is for them. And so the other people that are coming from outside the area that would not be a place that they'd be parking. And of course, a lot of people that are going there are not really, they're from the community as well. They're from RPV, they're mm -hmm. up there parking to use it yeah, as well. So it's true. Yeah. It's, it is a beautiful spot mm -hmm. to uh, enter the preserve and all of that. So mm -hmm. I know I did see that some of the homeowners were coming to the council meeting and uh, just concerned about what, what was going to be done. But like you well, say, something has to be done. Yeah, we're going to do something. And what I outlined was, was a kind of a first draft, but we do want to get input from the homeowners up, association up there. And it's not just Del Cerro, there's another homeowner association down toward uh, St. John Fisher's uh, uh, church. It's a small little cul-de-sac mm -hmm. over there. We need to make sure they're part of this program. and Because as the parking is paid parking, people will park further and further down Crenshaw. It may impact other neighborhoods down there. Right. So we're going to do this as a, as a first shot. And, and if we encounter more problems, we will address them as they come along. Okay. All right, moving on to a big subject of problems that you have to address all the time is crime and safety. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's been also making headlines in RPV. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone's concerned. We've seen, well, let's face it, the crime goes like this, but it mm -hmm. was, it's been feeling like an uptick with burglaries. We've seen the numbers go up and down. But the council is taking this as a top goal mm -hmm. to work with the sheriff's department. What's happening now in terms of just what we're trying to do here to, to help with um, for having additional services from the sheriff's department. Mm -hmm. You're looking into all kinds of things. Yeah, we are. Um, one is the possibility of having an additional patrol um, for um, an actual de dedicated deputy for RPV. Uh, we have, uh, we're looking at a dedicated uh, surveillance and apprehension, uh, uh, apprehension detective. Okay. So it's not just so much the patrols on the road. Sometimes if you have a good back up in terms of uh, trying to find and resolve these uh, crimes that you create a reputation that don't come in the neighborhood because you're going to get caught and you're going to go to jail. So the detective part of it is important. Follow-up is, is, is important. Uh, we're going to want to increase our volunteer patrols uh, driving around rather than just sitting at the desk down there at the, the office. Uh, yeah, the additional, sheriff's is recruiting for those volunteers right, patrol right we, now Right, we encourage actively. them to recruit for more. Uh, additional ALPR uh, readers, the license plate readers. We're looking for in, in not only in the cars, but in fixed stations. And we're looking at uh, radar speed controls for speeding. And the Southside Public Safety Task Force, that's also right. something that could that's assist right. with that. That's right. Mayor Pro Brooks and Councilman DeHovic are on the Southside Public Safety Task Force. We're looking to have possibly a station down on the South Side for not only sheriff and emergency services as well, ambulances and so on. Right. So I do know that, uh, and in terms of it being put into the budget, there was talk about putting another $25,000 into the, in the budget that would 
assist in paying for a car or what was going on? Well, it'd be more than $25,000 yeah, for yeah. a car. <laughs> additional deputies. That's to wash the car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Additional deputies are probably more yeah. than a quarter million. Yeah, than, no, than that's than what that, you're yeah. talking about. But uh, yes, we that's part of our budget for exercise. For the volunteers and patrol, maybe? Was that volunteers figure? and patrols, yes. We have, we're going to pay for the uniforms, that kind of thing. Yeah. Maybe that's about 25000 But we are looking, that's part of our budget exercise is where do we want to emphasize where the resource, financial resources we have to the best services to the city. And of course, you're working hand in hand with the Hampton <laughs> Bolton's team, and what is what is what kind of feedback are you getting? I mean, they they're seeing the need for this. Yes, and and Captain Bolin has been very good. He he works with us. He, we may have an idea of what we want for public safety, uh, but we need to get the feedback from him because he's the guy that's running the programs and he knows where the money can be best spent. So we're working closely with him to make sure our utilization of our financial resources is as effective as possible. Okay. All right. Um, Another big issue that came up deals with a very big poll outside <laughs> City Hall here. Um, talk about the monopoll and what, what that's all about when people are tuning into your City Council meeting. Yes. And they want to know. Um, it's well, uh, it's, Upper Point Vicente. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's an L.A., uh, let's call it the Los Angeles Regional Interoperable Communication I was letting System. You say that. The, uh, L.A. RICS okay, is, is a easier. short. And what they're trying to do in L.A. County is they're trying to coordinate all of the emergency responders onto one frequency to communicate in an emergency. It's, it's a lofty goal, it's fantastic, but they're searching for places to have these huge poles, and this is a, they're proposing a 70-foot pole with an additional 15 feet of some uh, 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 antenna or a, um, a lightning rod, I guess it is. And they want to put it right down on the Point Vicente, Upper Point Vicente area, Point Vicente Park, which is on the Coast Guard owns some of that land down there, put it on the Coast Guard land, but it's right down there, one of the most pristine, beautiful view areas in right. our city. And it would be replacing a pole that's already there, but it would have all this other stuff on it. The, the pole that's there, you can barely see. The one they want to put on has got a six foot diameter at the base and it tapers down, and they want to put par parabolic dishes on it, and there's a lot of stuff that <clears throat> could have a huge impact on the beauty of, of what we have in the city. So we're, we're trying to work with them. Uh, we, we have asked them if they can co-locate their, their needs someplace else. There's, there's a county fire station, fire station number 53 down there along the coast, they could put it. There's a lot of places they, they could find, they have a whole uh, installation on top of the hill, find a different way to, to operate this. And um, so we're, uh, we're asking them for details on it, but they're not coming forth with details and not a answering a lot of questions. This thing could require an FAA uh, blinking light at night. We don't know. Well, they, they don't know that because of the height of the pole and, and location and so on. So there's a lot of unanswered questions. We're not getting answers from them. So the item that came on the agenda was actually initially was you were prepared to actually send a letter out in opposition to what they're trying to do because mm -hmm. you wanted more information. But at this point, after the, everything that was discussed at the council and uh, the supporters of L.A. Ricks were there of the uh, keep putting a new poll in place, um, you all decided then just to continue looking into the matter. Is that where you're at, basically? Yeah, we, we, um, we may come back again. All, all, all I was asking is we put a letter together expressing our concerns mm -hmm. about the locations poll on this site to the resource agencies, to the Coast Guard, and say, we have a concern, and we listed the concerns we have. There's habitat issues. This is a NCCP uh, habitat area. They want to put all this stuff in. I mean, there's a lot of things that we have to consider that, that we, they have not considered for this. So they're going to get back to you with that information? Then? Is well, that I'm, I'm hoping so. It was kind of unclear. We. We asked them to look for other co-locations, other places. That's the bottom line. And, and uh, I don't know what they're going to come back with. So it's it's an unresolved thing right now. Okay. Well, we have lots going on in the city still as we start to try to wrap it up. What are some of the top things happening with you right now? As mayor going out into the community, I know you have all yeah. kinds of... Well, um, I, I've been very involved in the South Bay Cities Council of Government. And uh, that's a government organization that r works mostly in the South Bay. But it's a great resource for us, and I've been working with them to help make our city more energy efficient. Uh, they kind of helped me get pulled together this uh, li uh, street light inventory. I got the staff working on that. Um, they also have consultants for getting Measure R funding. Uh, and I, I've got on board now uh, the Western Avenue corridor f to, to be in the queue for Measure R funding. Um, so there's a lot of things that I've been working with the South Bay COG that um, um, I've, I've, I've 
generated a lot of savings to the city already. They have a lot of energy savings uh, uh, programs. They've helped us with the city uh, make make us more energy efficient. And as we get into more energy efficient areas, we get a reduction from Southern California Edison on our on the uh, kilowatt hours we pay. Um, we're up to about uh, about nine to twelve cents kilowatt hour savings huh. for every kilowatt hour um, that we're paying. I got. With this inventory that staff put together and the consultant put together, there's uh, something like 80, 70 or 80 poles, light poles we're paying for that, was that didn't exist. And so I, the, through the South Bay COG, there's a lot of savings we have been able to generate for the city. They help us get grants. Uh, there's a lot of things. So I've been working hard with them to, uh, to get the resources for the city to lower our, our tax burden and to uh, increase the efficiency of the use of the city so we can use our resources better. Okay. Because you were talking about utilities there for a minute, I want to jump back up because there was something on our list of topics to cover that's so important. I think we had to address that. And that is what was going on, just to update the residents with the um, what was going on with the UUT, with the telecommunications portion of that. Mm -hmm. What's going on with the user utility tax regarding that? Yeah. Um, well, we're only talking about the telecommunications Telecom component. Um, and uh, a while back earlier in the year, we uh, were trying to put forth a new measure ballot because our current ordinance that's on the books doesn't comply with the changing rules the FAA has set forth. So we wanted to propose to have uh, to update the, the ordinance and so it would be in compliance. That required a full unanimous vote. We couldn't get the unanimous vote on the council to do that. So it kind of went in hiatus for a while and then we decided that we don't want to have a non-compliant ordinance on the books, and so we decided at the last council meeting just to rescind the whole telecommunications portion of the UUT altogether and address it sometime down the road. And the non-compliance issue was that the city had been collecting a 3%, right, mm -hmm. um, a fee from, from the residents. And That's so for all utilities. All utilities, right. okay. Mm -hmm. And so, but the, and now residents can apply for a, re, a refund, right, up, yes, to, up on, through on the, the summer. Yes, on the telecommunications um, components. Right, which can average about $25. Maybe it's about $25, $35. So residents can do that. They, if they have any questions mm -hmm. about the refund process, mm -hmm. I got a phone number city. here for the city through August 5th, and that is... Uh, you can call the uh, claims administrator, and the number is 888-287-4974. So if residents want to mm -hmm. do that, and right. um, they also obviously go on the city website, and all the information right. is spelled out there. It's all spelled Which out there. That city website is looking great, and we're, it's such a wonderful it's, resource. It's a, yes, we're, we've improved it a lot. We so still need to get more uh, information on there, but we're, we're constantly working on that. Our yeah. pvca.gov. Right. Good stuff. Anything you want to add as we wrap it up? We've covered all kinds of things. No, so uh, reminding me about like the residents to no, conserve water. To conserve water. <laughs> and uh, we have the budget process coming up. If you uh, have any input on that, we'll be happy to hear from the residents. Uh, we're trying to uh, provide the maximum amount of services for the amount of resources we have. And I think we've done a good job in the past. And I, there's all likelihood we'll continue forward with that, that pattern. Mm -hmm. And things are going well. You've been mayor since for now going on almost half a year. Yeah, it's true. It's been all been awesome. Getting a half lot year. done. Yeah. <laughs> and more to go. Lots more to do. Yes, definitely. All right, Mayor Jim Knight. Thank you, as always, for being here in the studio. We'll see you next month. That'll do it for this edition of RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. Thanks for watching. See you next time.